Welcome to Rulers of the World, the podcast where we find inspiration from strong, creative, and brilliant women across the globe. Your host, Nardo Salamayo, talks to scientists, economists, activists, and more about how they are impacting their communities and why women rule the world. I am here with the lovely Abisha sister up in Toronto, Saron Gabrizelase. Thank you so much for uh, making the time to talk to us today. Thank now, you. one thing that you and I talked about in Detroit that I found disturbing and also fascinating was the issue of police brutality in Toronto that I think... Americans have this perception of Canada as this very happy, you know, peaceful place where, you know, no one has to pay for health care and, you know, everybody's just skipping along and being very polite with each other. And some of the stories that you were sharing with me were so intense about some of your clients, you know, people who've been putting comas and so much that had gone on. What has been the involvement of your law firm in those types of cases and and how has that issue progressed politically through things like Black Lives Matter and other organizations in Toronto? Yes, I mean, our fund has a long history with Black Lives Matter in Toronto, which is a incredible chapter. I think BLM in Toronto has really sort of been like the North Star guiding the community across the country in terms of really putting our issues on um, at the forefront. And we really, you know, struggled a lot with police brutality issues, even the, you know, the Eritrean community as well. There were a lot of fatalities. Um, one of my clients was, as you know, was put in a coma. And I, when we spoke out about that, it was really successful. I, um, I remember I put out a tweet just showing um, his injuries in terms of how bad his injuries were, of course, with the the blessings of the family, and it just went everywhere. It was shared thousands and thousands and thousands of times, and and so we were successful in fighting back in that particular case of my client at the time, named Lucy Geber Michael, and and then there was a lot of there was a big price to pay because he was so successful, and our and our firm was so successful in showing the dark side of Toronto policing and there was right. the police fought back really hard um wow. yeah and so on the one hand we had this like incredible like success with the family in terms of you know getting the demands met making sure he was released you then then going on to file you know a civil suit I'm very close with the family. They're donors to my campaign, longtime supporters. So they received, a, so he had a lot of success in that in that side. But but the success also came, like I said, with a very heavy price. I'm mm-hmm. sure. I'm sure. Mm-hmm. So what, yeah, were sure. they going after him or after the law firm, or kind of a mixture? A bit of both, and the media covered it pretty widely here, and the police. You know, the head of our police union is a fellow named Michael McCormack, who's just, uh, he'll make your police officers look like angels, let me tell you. Um, (laughs) And we all, and, you know, we have a very conservative, you know, premier right now. So he had fought back. But what what the police would do is when they would just double down. So when the media was covering the case, he would come up to the media saying it was all a lie saying that none of it was true, saying that this is all fabricated. And because he's in a, he's in a position of power and, is, you know, is the president of the police union, the media will, will report on that. And so sure. it, they really did a number on that narrative. And then they fought back even harder after where, a poli- where they made a complaint. I actually lost a complaint against my office about one tweet. You, you would never imagine that one tweet would cause so much havoc. Yeah. And so the police officer that made a complaint had since gone on to be appointed the deputy solicitor general of Ontario. And that's a really high ranking position. And I just thought, 
Right. You know, we're in the midst of COVID-19. How does the Deputy Solicitor General have time to be waging a war over a tweet from two years ago? So we continue to pay a price for that work. Wow. To this day, that's really unreal. That's really unreal. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But I feel like job. that's, yeah, that it really is part of the job. And I feel like whether it's, you know, legal work or grassroots activism or, you know, pushing policy agendas that are going to disrupt the status quo or the power dynamic that exists in a country, there is always a very heavy price to pay. How is the client doing now? Is he able to get his life back on track and, you know, move past it? Or is he still, you know, dealing with this on, you know, a regular basis? Yeah, well, his family's fantastic. He's doing, he's doing, you know, pretty good in terms of moving forward with his life. You know, I think in our, in our communities, we're just sometimes become, we've normalized the level of brutality to some degree. Mm, I think yeah. that's a survival technique. And so, you know, I mourn for that. That that's right. somewhat is kind of the the reality of of what our community has to has to deal with, but yeah, I I think, you know, I'm excited for for him and for his future, and I know he'll do great things. That's beautiful. Now I know you mentioned that you know the issues in the community. Is it mostly the migrant community who deals with this kind of level of brutality? Yes, our community does struggle with with this police brutality issue for a very, very long time. And it's also just working class people in general across the city because right. Toronto, if you've never been here, is an extraordinarily expensive city to live in. The cost of housing, I you just wouldn't believe. That. Yeah. And so it's all connected, you know, housing, quality right. of life, policing. So right. I, I wouldn't say it's relegated exclusively to, you know, to any one racialized community, but it does extend was, beyond that. Yeah. And part of the reason why I was asking was because of what you said about normalizing police brutality, because I know, you know, in the U.S., I feel that communities outside of the marginalized communities have normalized things like that, but I I still don't feel that marginalized communities have necessarily normalized police brutality to the point of, you know, kind of shrugging it off, you know, but I, I wonder with migrant communities how different that is because, you know, we all who, you know, we're our first generation or migrants ourselves are aware of that kind of there's a little bit of a different deferential attitude, I think, that sometimes comes from communities where they're afraid to speak up for themselves and they just want to maintain status quo. And I wonder how much that cultural dynamic has a role in combating police brutality in Toronto. I honestly have been around the block in terms of seeing, I've just seen so much over the last few years and sure. my concern with the community is that it is it's not that they've casualized uh casualized the the police brutality or that they've normalized it in in a traditional sense but the 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 response doesn't meet always the magnitude or mm. the scale of the problem so in that particular case I think we did a great job but it, we should have in light of what had happened there was so much more that needed to happen. Like there should have been a, an SIU investigation. There should have been X. There should have been Y. There should have been Z. And a, a, a strong community or strong families should be able in situations like that where it, it was and is life and death, you should be bringing a lot to the table to say, you know what, we're going to go the distance. Like we're going to bring more ammunition to this fight. We're not going to send you off you know, and mm. to, to bring a knife to a gunfight, so to speak. And so I have I have certain expectations in terms of what I expect. When in like tragedy and crisis hits the, the community. And so I, I think I'm hoping in the next five, maybe in the next 10 years or in our future, that if we want to see change, we're going to have to bring way more to the table. Right. And we do see a lot of instances of police brutality or of 
fatalities, as you know, I specialize in wrongful death cases where right. our mission is that those cases can never just become file numbers. We can't let, you know, the bureaucracy is more than happy to just, you know, call it, you know, file one, two point one, three point one, four point one a, and put it at the bottom of a list of files and let it collect dust. Like I have zero tolerance for that. So. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Good for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I felt that meeting you and you're young, you know, but very feisty. And, you know, I always like a lady who <laughs> is willing to jump into a fight. <laughs> when I met you, you were kind of in dabbling in political run at the time for mayor of Toronto. And I have, I'm guessing that a lot of what you've seen in your legal work was what kind of drove you to make that decision to become a candidate. Tell me a little bit about, you know, that decision-making process of, of why you decided to throw your hat in the ring. Yeah, so, I, and I'm still on the campaign trail. I mean, I, campaigning doesn't stop uh, between elections, but, you know. I love it. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just remarkable. Like I said, Toronto's such a remarkable place where the need is so it's, there's such an immense need on the ground. The majority of the population is working class. And it was really important that there, that people had an opportunity to vote for a candidate that reflected their values. And I was honestly just, I, I just couldn't believe. I was just blown away when I would see who the candidates were, who was always putting their hat in the ring, and, and, and the caliber and the quality of candidates, I thought really wasn't reflective, like wasn't wasn't prepared to to go to bat for the working class in the city. So our mm -hmm. candidates, like I don't, our current mayor John Tory, has a long, you know, a long career in the corporate sector. Went to private right. schools his whole life, you know, like every stereotype you could possibly attribute <laughs> to a politician. Like he just checks off every single box, and I just thought. How can you possibly champion the needs of the working class? How can you even relate? <laughs> How right. could you even you? He, right. He, he's probably never really truly experienced adversity, and so I just felt that the working class in our city needed a champion, like really needed somebody that was willing to stick their neck out for for them and to take it all the way to city hall. So that was what really inspired me to to go for it. I love that. And honestly, I feel that that is one thing that I, I do love about the United States is, you know, the federal government, I don't always feel represents the community, but you do see so many people in local government. And unfortunately, people don't pay enough attention to their local politics just because people are, you know, comfortable turning a blind eye to it. But I, I I have seen so much, especially being on the East Coast now in D.C., where there is a lot more, there are a lot more of people who, you know, really are part of the community. And it's not to say that a person who's from an affluent background can't become a champion for the people, but you have to put in the work in order to really build that relationship, you know, with the community. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I definitely, I respected the fact that you jumped in there and, you know, to be honest, I mean, you're young, it's not, and it's a huge city, you know, mm -hmm. so not being from a political background and not being well-connected and being, you know, in your early thirties, it's a daunting task. So, you know, it's pretty amazing that you would, you know, jump in there like that. I was really impressed, but I, one thing that you had talked about when in one of your debates, you had talked about police salaries. And I thought that was really interesting that the the salary of the police chief and the amount of the budget that goes to salaries specifically. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, the police budget is enormous in Toronto. It's a tenth of the city of the city budget. It's you know, we taxpayers pay more into the police budget than into libraries, into, you know, the arts, into social services, economic development combined. So it's a, it's a very large line item. And so 
what our platform called for was repurposing the police budget and, you know, drawing attention to the fact that it hasn't actually succeeded. Like every every few years, there is, a, you know, a spike in gun violence and then there's an outcry and then this, the, the default place is, okay, well, let's put more money into the police budget. But we've seen it you know, in 2004, at that time, I actually had met with our prime minister then to call for a community-based strategy to eradicate gun violence. And then I was running for mayor, and that was like, what, 15 years later, and the same, it was like deja vu. It was the same conversation being had all over again. It was just, it's like Groundhog Day, like history just keeps repeating wow. itself over right. and over. And so, you know, trying to win over Canadians through just basic logic to, to to let them know that it actually hasn't succeeded, it's never succeeded, and that if we want to eliminate gun violence, we actually can be successful at it, but we can't do the same things over and over expecting different results. So I thought, I, I felt that we had really won over a good segment of the public with that, you know, with that logic. I love that. Yeah, it was just really interesting to me. I think it was like a quarter of a million dollar salary that you mentioned for the chief of police. And I thought like, holy crap, like that's supposed to be a, a position of public service, not to say that they shouldn't be able to, you know, live a comfortable life, but that is just an enormous salary. And, you know, I know people with multiple masters and PhDs who are in very professional environments who do not make a quarter of a million dollars, even after decades of work, you know, so that yeah, right. it blew my mind. It really blew yeah. my mind. Yeah, a lot of people yeah. felt that way here. I'm sure, I'm sure. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about the full scope of your platform, because you have, I believe it's like six points that are your main drivers in your campaign. So tell us about all of that. Yeah, so housing is, has been an issue that's really sort of the heart and soul of the campaign. And if you ever come to Toronto, like I said, it's just wild to me how how much the cost of housing has skyrocketed. People cannot afford to live in Toronto at all. It's like an average apartment downtown Toronto is, is pushing 3000 a month in our city. And obviously salaries can't keep up. So I would just hear story after story after story of my constituents saying, we just can't keep up. It's always head above water. The rent is eating up the lion's share of, of the salary of our paychecks that come in. It's really bad for morale as well in terms of even like young people and recent grads and millennials who are, you know, pretty hungry and eager to succeed and, and ready to you know, want to launch their own ventures and, and, and launch their own careers and are stuck in this perpetual kind of cycle of, you know, of either, you know, first poverty or even if it's not outright poverty, just like this barrier it, it, uh, that really inhibits their ability to succeed because they're just constantly what comes in one hand leaves the other through the rent. And so I feel that housing is so deplorable the state of housing and that's why I said that I would mm. upon being elected would call for a state of emergency on housing and get the housing situation you know under control the other really important piece of the platform platform point was mental health services it, it has become clear over the years but like how much of a challenge mental health issues were in our city so that like there's a whole range you have um, a lot of um, addiction issues in certain parts of the city, but then there's also, you know, the full range of bread and butter mental health issues that people experience just by virtue of living in a city that is so high frequency, that is so expensive, that is so, you know, can be so lonely for so many people. Yeah. So mental health is, some, is a, an issue that I've always um, advocated for and continue to. I also called for free transit, and that's an issue that I've I've always believed in free transit. You know, as far back as middle school, I just I, I just believe that a visionary city and a city that is accessible to people, to everyone, regardless of their income background, should be should be free. And that was actually very successful. So when I first introduced free transit, I remember I I was in a press conference, and the press looked like 
the floor had dropped when I <laughs> had unrolled free transit for all. But since that time, it's it's in Canada, free transit is now mainstream. So it was wow. introduced in, uh, yeah, in a lot of cities in Victoria and Edmonton. And even during COVID, free transit is like it has taken off in multiple cities across Canada. It was introduced in Parliament. It was taken up provincially. And so free transit, we actually expect it to be on the ballot in 2022 in the next uh, provincial election. So it just goes to show That's how... incredible. Yeah, how how um how the public can change. They just yeah. we just need the leadership, right? So yes, we have free transit, mental health, housing were really the top the top three issues um, on the platform that gained the most traction. I love that, and you know, it's funny that you mention how much traction it's gotten because when you first said free transit, and you know, I read a little bit about it, but. I thought in my mind initially, like that would never happen in America. Like we can't get like free nothing, you know, like everything <laughs> is for money in the United States. But at the same time, you know, I think about Bernie Sanders and, you know, there are some things that I disagree with him on and, you know, some of the logistics that he's come up with, sometimes the math doesn't always add up to me, but, you know, conceptually, I think morally free healthcare, free education, those kinds of things I believe in, but it's interesting to me how he did not get the nomination in 2016, but his involvement in the process of the presidential election really did drive a lot of conversation and it really has become a a very mainstream idea. And you saw this, you know, with this most, the current election going on, you saw these democratic candidates really trying to like one up each other on who could be more liberal with their, you know, free, (laughs) free healthcare, you know, program. So it really does just take that person to start the conversation and put it into the zeitgeist. And, you know, as long as you are well-researched and, you know, you present your ideas in an intelligent way, I think that people are more receptive to things than we think that they are. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, absolutely. And we're um, big supporters of Bernie Sanders out here in Canada too. So I um, really, can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> really enjoyed watching it. Actually, we were I'm planning sure. to go to Iowa to knock on doors, but yeah, he should have been yes. the nominee. But the, the whole world is upside down like, these days. <laughs> you never know. Exactly. There's a whole revival campaign because you know, not to want to tangent, yeah. but Joe Biden is not the nominee yet. So, yes, that's very true. That's very true. And at this point, anything can happen. I mean, I feel like the yep. whole world is in this weird state of like, up is down, black is white, and <laughs> anything does. goes, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a great. Good yeah, it definitely does. No kidding. No <laughs> kidding. I just, you know, one thing that I liked about your approach to lowering crime as well. I think this like represents something about women that is a unique skill. I'm always fascinated by women who are either community leaders or leaders in their field of business or whatever. Women have a tendency to see problems very holistically and we see the steps that come next before we make decisions, you know, we don't always hit it out of the park and there are, you know, exceptions to every generalization for sure. But one thing that I appreciated about your platform is that you were talking about lowering crime in the context of these three main points a lot about public housing, about mental health, about living an impoverished life and how those things impact crime and really bringing a different, you know, narrative to instead of investing all of this cash into the police budget and which ends up going mostly to salaries, invest that money, you know, somewhere else. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious what kind of challenge that presents for someone who is new to the political game while you're in the midst of campaigning and going up against these machines, you know, how do you drive that narrative and break through that wall to really get your message across and gain traction? Yes. Well, I am, 
you're right. I think women do see can, can see issues more holistically, and I really um, I felt the education piece had to be there, and and that, like I said, the public and the community will come on side, whoever can you know win them over and um, advance the best argument really and and so you know I, I thought that we had we did do a pretty solid job of of communicating that on the ground and then it was important to me in the campaign to really practice what we preach they say that the mm. that the best indication of how one will govern you it can be gleaned from how one runs their campaign so how you run your campaign is how you will govern because essentially one is the ceo yes. of his or her own campaign and so it was important to me that we actually solicited expertise from those who are in conflict with the justice system so my campaign did have um, co-chairs that are incarcerated in a number of our really? um, prisons. Yes, yes. And they're still very active. That Some have been since released. That is a very creative idea. Yeah. And we've got a lot of fantastic ideas, actually. People would be surprised. Like, it does surprise people sometimes, like, you know, the mainstream, the mainstream public, right? But who better to inform us on criminal justice reform and on eradicating and eliminating crime than those who are incarcerated and those who have may have had a past with crime or have been involved in crime. That's yes. like, you know, so it's just to me, again, it's, it, it, it is logical. It is sound. It's sober. So yeah, so that's where a lot of, a lot of the ideas came from was from, um, was from our. hundred percent. I love this idea. The criminal justice system. I mean, globally, this is an issue, but that is one of the most infuriating things about the United States as well, that just seeing this constant revolving door of mass incarceration, and there really aren't any voices being heard from within. The, and you see it now with COVID-19 and people who are trying to sneak videos of what's going on inside of there. And still, you know, not that much is being done to support them. That How did you go about selecting the people who were going to be involved with your campaign? Well, actually, they selected selected us and and wow. not the other way around. So a lot of them are actually activists and active and active. So one one of them is released now. Um, a couple, some of them are released, and some of them again have gone on to do great things. Like one of our campaign members has gotten like multiple awards, and you know and are now thought leaders in this area, but they solicited the campaign while they were incarcerated. And yeah, and I remember one of them, Vernon, he he contacted our office and had us come in to Toronto Self Detention Center, which is very well known in Canada. It's kind of equivalent to Rikers Island in New York. But he brought in everyone to, to Toronto South. He brought in the UN, he brought in the African Canadian Legal Clinic and would give tours. He did so much advocacy um, while he was incarcerated, and he really wanted the world to see what was taking place behind closed doors at Toronto Self Detention Center, and and so that was how that partnership was formed. Really yeah. incredible. Check out part two for more of our conversation with Saron Gabrielasse. Thanks for listening. Follow us on social media and drop a review on our channel. Check back weekly for new episodes. We'll see you then.